not clap, which is a shame because I like applause. Um, good evening and welcome. Uh, so nice to see everyone coming in. Um, we are really excited, and the good news is all the applause goes to all of you tonight. Uh, a, for showing up, and B, for your participation. Um, this is not the flight to Albuquerque, so if you're on the wrong flight after I give the brief overview, you are welcome to stay. Uh, this is really a participatory session, so we will frame some pieces, but this is your community and this is your conversation about the future of learning in Manchester. Um, so, this says futures of learning, community visioning experience. Um, I think one point we make in a conversation like this is <coughs> there is not one future. There are many futures, just like there's not one education program for children because you have 13,000 unique individuals in your system, just K-12. So um, this session is kicking off right now. And for the next uh, 87 and a half minutes, we're going to be on a journey together. Excuse me, can you tell me who you are? Of course I can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adam Rubin, and we are partners with Manchester Proud. Uh, I was a teacher. I was an administrator. I'm an entrepreneur. But I really cut my teeth in public education, despite 25 years in it, when I became a father. Uh, and I've got four girls in various stages of public education where we live, and I live in Vermont. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? We have a Swahili interpreter, and so if there's anyone who needs Swahili, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So. Um, would love to lay out some norms for our session. We had a great session last week at Northwest. Um, similar size crowd, very, very passionate. And we just want to set some norms, and you can add to these norms. Respect uh, is essential. You know, we will not see things the same way. And so if everyone can agree to the norm of respecting one another's voice, listen as a learner. Everyone is in this conversation. You're here. You're taking time out of your busy schedules because you're passionate about public education in the city. So really kind of listen to others. You want to share the airtime and share the airtime. Um, you know, when we get passionate, we tend to expound, and sometimes we lose ourselves, present company included. So, you know, appreciate that we only have a couple, hour, an hour and a half together. So as you're sharing, just, you know, Make sure that we, we share what we want to share and we make sure other voices get heard. Um, so, would anyone want to add anything just kind of as ground rules for how we play together over the next couple of hours? Cell phones on silent. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Cell phones on silent. Anything else to add? Excellent. Thank you for Thank sharing. You. And if I can and Rachel can speak directly, you let me know. Like if it's helpful to see me. Any other norms that are helpful? All right. Can we all just by a show of hands agree to these norms? Excellent. Thank you all very, very much. My name is Rachel, um, and like Adam, I too used to be a teacher. I taught ninth grade French in Maine, um, which was lots of fun, and then I've done lots of other exciting things in education, and while I don't have four kiddos, I'm super passionate about what's happening here in Manchester, and I'm so excited to get to share a little bit of a learning journey with you all tonight. So we're going on a learning journey. It's going to be a long, wild journey with many twists and turns. It's designed as an emotional experience for you. So there will be maybe moments during this journey that make you feel excited, things that maybe make you feel anxious or stressed, um, and things that maybe make you feel um, passionate or invigorated for the future. And we're going to go on this together. And this learning journey is designed to provoke you. And that's intentional because we found um, from brain science 
that when we provoke, you remember it. So we're not trying to sell anything. There's no agenda about what we think Manchester should be or should do. Instead, we're going to show you a couple videos, and we're going to go on a journey together to provoke, to inspire, to give you re a place to react, and to think together about the future of Manchester schools, like for her. Um, so our journey takes place in three parts. First, we're going to take a tour of the history of public education in the US. It maybe won't look quite like that, but we'll see. Next, we're going to think about the future of education. We're actually going to look at a video um, that Stanford University made, and they did a visioning session just like this one in 2015, and they thought about Stanford in 2025, and they made a series of videos on that. And finally, we're, our journey ends in the present. We're going to come back to the current world of work and what work is like for today, and how can we prepare kids for that journey. After our learning journey ends, we're going to take what we learned and what we experienced, and we're going to think we're going to bring it back to Manchester. We're going to think about what kids in Manchester need to know and be able to do in order to be successful in that future. So that's the arc of our journey tonight. Um, we're going to use a lot of stickies. We're going to get up and move around the room. Um, but you've got lots of materials on your table. If at any point you need more, just give us a shout. We've got plenty in my bag, and we'll give you some more. Before we get started, I'm going to do what we call a stoke, which is a design activity we can do together. To do that, you each need a piece of the large white paper and a Sharpie. And once you have your white piece of paper, fold it in half, like this, hamburger style. And on one side, please write your name. So I'm Rachel, here's my name. <laughs> and once you have your name written down, you've just made a new friend. Please give it to someone else at your table. <laughs> journey. 
And there are three stops on this first part of the journey. Has anyone seen the movie Most Likely to Succeed? Has anyone seen it? Okay. So if we had a lot more time and some popcorn, we might watch the whole movie. But we don't have a lot more time. We don't have popcorn. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch the first six minutes of a snippet that really talks about the history of education and how we got here. smart people. But after the Prussians were embarrassed in the Napoleonic Wars in the 1800s, this Prussian decides to institute a new type of education for every German boy from 7 to 14 years old, which results in a more fit, more organized, more obedient army. Among his many reforms was this idea, to divide up instruction according to age, ability, and subject matter. Strange as it seems today, this had never been done before. This idea of teaching math in one room, science in another room, language skills in yet another was totally new. Horace Mann witnesses this new educational model and he's stunned. Inspired by what he sees, he brings these educational ideas back to the US where it captures the attention of these men. Just like the Prussians, who were anxious to develop more obedient troops, these fathers of the Industrial Revolution were desperate to transform our nation of disorganized farm laborers into trained, efficient workers for their factory and assembly line jobs. We divide the day up uh, in high schools into bits of time, you know, to 40 or 50 minute blocks, and then we ring bells and people start to shuffle around the building and do something else. That's an organizational device, it's not an educational principle. And it is, in, in broad sweeps, uh, a system that resembles a factory culture. If you built a factory in upstate New York and another along the Ohio River, you desperately needed these workers to behave similarly, to know the same kinds of things. If high school graduates in Ohio could quote Shakespeare, but students in New York couldn't even write their own name, it was difficult to build a standard set of factories which utilized both sets of workers. That's when it was decided to form a committee called the Committee of Ten. The committee was tasked with coming up with a standard set of subjects every <coughs> kid should know. Ten University of Heads in 1890 said, in 11th grade, everyone should learn chemistry. In senior year, everyone should learn physics, and that it should be earth science. They came up with this whole trajectory calculus, and, and all, a lot of these subjects are great, but these priorities were, were dictated 120 years ago, 124 years ago. Back in 1892, the Committee of Ten designed our nation's curriculum, and for the most part, it has not changed. The biggest part of Baltimore 50 years ago was Bethlehem Steel Company. You could actually drop out of high school if you could go join the Steel Union, uh, get a perfectly average job, earning a perfectly average wage, which would time to get a perfectly average mortgage to buy a perfectly average house with a perfectly average yard to have 2.0 perfectly average kids who would go to a wonderful perfectly average public school. You could have a perfectly average retirement and have a perfectly average funeral. That is no longer the case. 
the economy that we created over the course of the 20th century was an economy that needed a large number of moderately skilled people who could do the three R's and who could follow pretty simple instructions. As we head deeper into the 21st century, I really don't think that's the case anymore, yet our educational system still seems to be focused on turning out people with that same relatively small set of skills. My fear is that they're heading into a society and an economy and a workforce that doesn't value those skills very much anymore. And I think we need to take a good hard look and figure out what kinds of people, what kinds of skills are demanded in the technologically extraordinary society and economy that we're creating. Okay, um, what we would, uh, apologies for the sound, um, is because we're simulcasting instead of HDMIing, it's, it's stuck on the system here. Um, if folks need seats, there are seats over here. So we would love you to write things that stuck out to you when you watched that. Things that stuck out to you, write them big and write them with a Sharpie. Um, in school, we call that cheating. Here, we call it collaboration. And in our workplaces, we call it collaboration. So nice and big so other folks can see. One thing that stood out, you've got about a minute. Okay, so what were some ideas that emerged for you? Bless you. What were some ideas that emerged? Some thoughts, please. A few people decided what they needed and trained everyone to their needs. Uh-huh. So we had a driver for the system, and it dictated what the system looked like for all kids. Sounds rational. At a moment in our history. Um, other reactions? Please. Uh, an absolute focus on the contributions of the kids to the economy and nothing about growing them as a whole person, like in terms of citizenship and community and things like that. Yeah, so at the time this public education system was kind of imprinted, we were solving a set of problems. Um, and we weren't thinking about whole child, we were thinking about whole GDP. <laughs> And, you know, and, and a standardization process, absolutely. Re other reactions, please. A lack of communication between teachers and students or students and students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we don't get any sense of valuing one-to-many, one-to-one, no sense of that. Please. Um, it was about creating obedient workers. There was nothing about the individual talent, gifts, or abilities of yeah, this idea of obedience, standardizing, everyone in straight rows, everyone behaves. I don't know if anyone, I've seen it a few times. So that high school picture, that, that still of those kids in the high school classroom, they weren't that engaged, were they? <laughs> no. Please. I think that the purpose of the film is for us to, to look at education as an evolutionary process always changing and we need to look at it differently because I, I know what education is today is completely the opposite of what happened to me in the 50s and the 60s. 
Okay, so it's been evolving from your perspective. It has been evolving. Yeah. And it needs to continue to evolve. Yeah. Yeah. Our society is changing really quickly. And I think, you know, one of the punchlines of a film like this is maybe our education system hasn't caught up with where our society is going. Please. You skipped over the earlier history of public education in this country, which actually started right here in New England, where we had the one-room schoolhouse mm -hmm. with highly collaborative learning structures. And uh, I, I think it's unfortunate that you did that. Yeah. Well, um, you know what's interesting is our education system has evolved a lot, and some of the best ideas haven't necessarily followed through at scale, like the one-room schoolhouse. So it's a very good point. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? We're very robotic. Robotic. They, they all report. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think for me it was the intense need for transformation if we're going to really prepare our kids for what's coming ahead of us down, not what was ahead of us. Yeah. Yeah. We talk a lot. Um, so we do this work in 35 states with a lot of cities around the country work like this and really deep capacity building work in schools. And one of the things that's interesting is we're beginning to talk a lot about future of world and future of work. The world is changing really rapidly, more rapidly than any point in our history, just the exponential changes. And yet we're asking a system to adapt and it's not you know, let's not condemn the system. The system is a victim of how it's been developed and how it's been maintained, but we need it to go to a next place, and I think that's a conundrum. Any other reactions? Please. I just thought one size fits all. Yeah, you know? one size fits all. Absolutely. So increasingly in public education, the languages we use, there are a lot of buzzwords like personalized learning, individualized learning, you know, one size doesn't fit all. We need a school for every kid or that idea. And yet this and this, this imprint of our public education system is trying to meet the needs of tens of thousands of students in your city. And it's hard to standardize customization. We haven't figured that out in public education. Any other thoughts or reactions? It's very interesting. <laughs> it's very interesting who tells history sometimes. They're also, we're mostly, if not all, in this video, uh, white folks. So not a diverse representation. And some of those initial pictures, I felt like I was in like a dystopic film. I felt like a Handmaid's Tale, those like early kids. So in any event. The media we have in this space is largely, you know, made by white filmmakers right now. So it's a great point. And often male. This was a male filmmaker. Any other kind of reactions? I'm curious how, please. There was no change in over 100 years. Yeah. So, yeah, so I wouldn't say, I mean, you know, again, a, a film has limited power in six minutes to convey complexity. I think there's been a ton of change in public education. I, I question, and this is your community, if you question it, we'll talk about it. If the change has been quick enough, and forget quick, forget speed, if the change has kept up with a changing set of needs of learners and a changing set of needs of the economy, and I think that's a really important question to be asking yourselves. All right. I just say, I thought it was really interesting when they talked about, and the first time we separated the math in this room, and, and now we're putting them back together again in so many ways when we're doing project-based learning and other functions that we're starting to bring curriculum cross-curricular as opposed to separating it. So we're kind of going in a, in a circle with something. Maxine gets her nickel. Thank you, Maxine. It's a great segue. So, uh, yeah, and, and it's a really good point. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a really quick trip. I also like how, uh, I think it was Ken Robinson in this one, who talks about this idea of organizational devices. We have bells that still go off. 
We grade like we graded meat in the 1890s. I feel like I'm in an Upton Sinclair jungle. Like, that's a grade A of beef. That's a grade A on your paper. So, you know, there's a lot of organizational devices that we have borrowed from industry from the 1880s, 1890s, 1910. And they're, they're present, they're not just present, they kind of govern the structure of school. So it's an interesting observation we wanted to share. Okay, this is a very different video. I want to issue some disclaimers at the beginning of it. This is not a conversation about higher ed. I appreciate that. This is not Stanford University. I appreciate that. When Rachel spoke a few minutes ago, she talked about provocation. The design of this conversation is really about intentional provocation. We're not embracing any of these ideas. They're meant to provoke you to be able to kind of set you up to have a meaningful conversation about what you want here. So with all of those disclaimers, this is a two minute video made by friends of ours at the Stanford Design School. Stanford University was trying to kind of create a vision for 2025. And they did these really kind of fun two minute videos, but they were made in the year 2021. What? Are we going to have better sound? We should have sound. All right, cool. It may blow us out. In 1887, more than a century before our collaborative teaching hubs were built, the cornerstone of Stanford University was set. Bricks became walls, and walls became buildings, and it was within these buildings that students would come to find their future. But when the global economy fell apart at the turn of the century, the future reinvented itself. The workforce became fractured, old paths crumbled, and fresh paths collided. Employees needed adaptable skills and the ability to reinvent themselves. The buildings of Stanford could no longer help students find a future. It had to prepare them to invent it. In 2020, Stanford announced Access Flip. The architecture of schools and departments concentrated around one academic field was completely reorganized. Stanford built teaching hubs concentrated around competencies and skills rather than disciplines. Deans were appointed to these hubs and oversaw the ebb and flow of these skills on campus and in the real world. Departmental professors were encouraged to remix their curriculum in ways that showcased alongside faculty from other disciplines. This transition took transcripts, which attempted to show what a student has done, and replaced it with the skill print. A dynamic portfolio of student skills and experiences designed to show an employer not what they have taken, but what they have to give. From buildings to building blocks, a Stanford education became not about what you know, but about how you use it. All right. An abrupt ending. <laughs> <laughs> They're working on their closure. All right. So, one of the reasons we want to talk about this is because it is not right or wrong, but it might give you something when you think about the future of learning here. So take another minute and jot down kind of one or two thoughts that grabbed you from that, that you liked, that you didn't like, that you think might be applicable in some strange way to this conversation.
right, so I would love for you to take a couple minutes at your table and just share some of your thinking. What did you like? What did you not like? What feels applicable? What grabbed you in that conversation, in that video? Centers at home, you're set up. All right. Old child. Good. All right. Thank you. Anyone else burning to share what they were struggling with with this? Okay. Anyone here want to share what resonated with you? Please. Um, so I'll give you a, like a concrete example. I'm, I'm one of those people that tend to take tests. So freshman year, anatomy and physiology, and physiology in college. I did so well on the first three tests that I didn't even have to go for like the rest of it. I still got an A in A and P. Can't tell you, like, I don't know anything. I've memorized it for the test and regurgitated it. Now I'm a yoga teacher and I like teach movement. Um, and I, I'm thinking through and actually learning and 
studying with my own anatomy and like going to my PT and like learning actual human anatomy and physiology, but like the application of it makes it stick, it makes it worthwhile, I know where I'm going with it. Um, so I think that a lot about school and like, you know, even these kids that can do great, like how much are they really getting out of it? Whereas we could be, you know, with more experiential learning and less focus on grades, what well, we actually could be, you know, helping their passion or like really investigate and explore their own curiosity for a purpose. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Any other residents? Some of what we were talking about this is really more about learning how to learn and not so, so um, compartmentalized into certain content per se. And uh, like you said, information is changing so much, it's exponentially changing. Um, but more about the application, you know, how do you use this knowledge? And I think with project-based learning, that's what we're trying to do. You have this, now you're gonna, you know, you're gonna create or present something to show your knowledge, not just regurgitate for a test where, you know, I just sat in on, um, for the, for the state test, the state assessments, we had to align with the standards. And when you really look at, off, at, at a lot of those questions, the answers are right there. It's, they're so literal, um, it's really <coughs> not about, it's about finding it right the, then and there, not applying it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Thinking more critically and yeah. reasoning, which, which those little words, those yeah. are the ones that popped out to me. The Excellent. communication, the reasoning. And Good. The Finns are giving open internet tests. You know, it's not the information in your phone, it's how you actually use it. Uh, anyone else want to share? All right, please. I think one of the things that they shared in the video, like different teachers helping to build the curriculum, is which is kind of like what PBL is. You have a group of teachers, like my daughter's in second grade this year, and they did a PBL project on water. So all the second grade teachers, different skills, different abilities, are all coming together to help the second graders learn about water, applying their skills, it's not just about, oh, this is what I learned, I took a test, I got an A, mom, like, this is how we do it, this is how it tracks, this is how we get it from here, it goes there, so that different, it kind of, kind of what you do in college, like, you have different professors that have different skills, they're teaching you different things, so I feel like they're starting to build that into the classroom, and, like, my daughter was, like, excited about water, and I think that's cool, like, a second grader is excited about something, I think it intrigues them, it's not just about, this is what you have to know to pass the test. It's like, oh, this is like applies to the world that I live in, and this is how we can see it. And I think it makes them be intrigued. It makes them be excited about learning. It's not just, oh, we learned this because we had to learn it to pass the new state test. It's causing them to think outside the box. Absolutely. Um, I love that your daughter was excited about water. She might be thirsty, <laughs> but you know, we don't know. We don't have all the data. Okay, a couple more, and then we're going to transition. I, I think what happens is you. I, I retired. Uh, two years ago, and from teaching physical science, and we were a competency-based <coughs> school for about six, seven years. Our biggest hurdle to jump, because we weren't giving A, Bs, and Cs, you know, you were either competent, or not competent, or satisfactory, mm -hmm. to all parents, <coughs> in the one and A. Also, educating colleges. They still are in that phase of A, B, C, yeah. and it's all memory work yeah. to get that in. Yeah, it's and a great point. I mean, there's an economy, out, there's a market out there that doesn't necessarily speak this language. Good news is it's changing. There are 140 universities in the United States that have signed on to competency-based transcripts and are trying to educate themselves, and that's growing. But we don't want to hold our kids harmless. Right? Like, we want to hold our kids harmless. We don't want to put them in harm's way by minimizing their opportunity horizon, whatever they want to do. So it's a really important point. But I, I do, kids that I've had six, seven years ago remember the labs and make connections. Yeah. When they did that, when the kids I had 20 years ago, it was like... Yeah, yeah, excellent, thank you. All right, one last point, and then we'll transition. Um, we just mentioned at our table that it was interesting that they mentioned a, a dean of ethical practice and just the, the sort of resonance, resonance that that has to us as something that's really important as opposed to a dean of humanities or anthropology and, and just sort of recognizing both the intent of the what they were talking about in terms of skill-based learning and then also sort of some of the system changes that would be necessary to realize that intent. 
Yeah, it also raises the question of values and the centrality of values. And values, I appreciate, is a complex conversation. Um, and our kids spend a lot of time in buildings and instilling them with a set of shared values that the community comes up with, you know, may or may not be happening to your heart's content. All right, we could talk for each one of these for hours, but I'm going to transition. So I have one more video to show you. Um, and at this point, you may be asking yourselves, like, oh my gosh, what is up with all these videos? And so this is also really intentional, right? So we think about science and research again for a second. If I just stood up here and talked to you about all these ideas, in a couple days, you'd probably remember like 10 or 15% of what I said. Um, but if I show you a video, that number jumps to like close to 60%, I think. Um, so we're doing this for a way for you to retain it because we also want you to have these conversations with your own communities and share what you learned in this experience and kind of broaden it beyond just this room. So one last stop on our journey, the current world of work. Again, this is a provocation. Um, it is not the future. It is showing things currently happening in the U.S. just going to have a share out whole group, a couple reactions to that video. Feel free to shout them out. We're obsolete. Scary. Yeah, Sorry? Scary. Scary? Yeah. Yeah. Scary. Scary, obsolete, what else? By the time our kids are ready to join the workforce, there's going to be no problem. It's going to be one big unemployed country. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people come out and say the reason why all these drugs are laws is because of immigrants and also globalism. It is the main uh, focus has been 
robots are replacing workers in factories. Right, the impact of automation. So it's not, it's, it's not be, nothing we can do about it, but mm -hmm. train people, mm -hmm. which is education, mm -hmm. something else. There's a whole bunch of programmers behind every one of those robots. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Right. Enough, those are jobs. Those are jobs. They're just not the humans that you see in the picture. Right? That's what we have. Sure. I don't know. I think to me, like, it's just scary, like, how fast technology is moving, I guess. And I think that the world that we live in is partly because us, as humans, we become impatient to wait for things. You know, when you have DVR that can rewind your show and pause your show, and when I have my, you know, eight-year-old asking me, can you pause this while I go to the bathroom? You know, like, before when I was a kid, my mom would have been like, you're going to miss it. It's fine. You'll come back to it when you get I think that, to me, is scary, the fact that we reliant We've become so reliant on things just being like this. You know, our kids don't know how to wait for things anymore, and we wonder why kids are impatient. Well, they don't have to wait for anything, so why would they be patient? So this may not be the right version of our future, right? But it's an example of what could and indeed in some places is already happening. So you guys have a lot of stickies. I'm going to ask you to do one more sticky activity. Um, and again, why are we writing everything down? So we can help remember it and retain it, right? So in this future, in, in the future, skip one more. What do kids need to know and be able to do in order to be successful? Sorry. Take two minutes. There's one more instruction. One more instruction. You need to take a specific colored sticky depending on your role. If you're a student, take some green. If you're a parent, blue. If you work in Manchester School District, that's pink. And then a community member, yellow. Now you may be some of those things. Choose the role that fits for you tonight. And take two minutes. One idea for sticky. The request is what do kids need to know and be able to do to be successful in the future? What do Manchester kids need to know and be able to do? If you need a certain color, let me know.
this way. Connect you. So when you finish, come back to your seats. Okay, if I could ask you to have a seat or stand. It's up to you. All right. So, we have a pop quiz. It's a very nerve-wracking moment for me because it's a testing for your understanding. And it's nerve-wracking for you because you haven't studied for this pop quiz. So, pop quiz. Why are we doing that last activity? Why are we doing that last activity? It's nerve-wracking. Yes, please. Because you care, care about education, absolutely. Well, that's why you're here, for sure. This specific activity is absolutely because you care about education, but what might we do with this? Please. Find a commonality of ideas among the group. Yeah, so we want to find commonality of ideas across this group, across other groups. One of the biggest challenges, I think, in large-scale systems change, and there's a lot of research around this, and we all will probably nod our heads, is when change happens to us, it is less successful. I don't care where you are in the system. If you're an innocent bystander, if you're on the front lines, if you're a student, family, you want to be included in the process meaningfully included, and one of the biggest gaps, I would, as an outsider, I can say this, and you can tell me to leave, and <laughs> we'll have to, but I think one of the biggest gaps right now is a coherence gap. This system is not clear what it's aiming at, and that's not a critique. Lots of systems around the country don't have a clear North Star, a clear vision for what they want kids to know and be able to do and for what they think is getting in the way. So we're trying to crowdsource from, you know, I ideally thousands, but we'll take hundreds, to begin to populate, what is the portrait of a Manchester graduate? Because once we have a portrait of a graduate, we begin to have more clarity for what curriculum instruction assessment needs to look like to get there for what professional learning should look like, for what the equity agenda should look like, for how we allocate resources and how we say no to certain things. One of my least favorite districts I've worked in, I won't tell you the name, Denver, um, <laughs> 85,000 kids, so big, Purple State, so interesting for all the national funders, really diverse all representations, you know, strong middle class, you know, huge free and reduced numbers. We used to call them, and we worked with Tom Bosberg for years, the superintendent. They had a Christmas tree of change strategy. They had ornaments. They had hundreds of ornaments on their tree because they didn't suffer from the fiscal challenges you all suffer from. And they were a darling to the national foundations. It's hard to move the needle when you have all those ornaments on a tree. So this is a coherent strategy and it's trying to go to the end users to begin to inform that. So one call to action is, let's get thousands of people. If we run two, three, four of these sessions directly, but you all know 10 people, you know, informing this conversation will make it your conversation. One of the things that, um, we would be remiss if we didn't do, and we didn't do last week, um, so we were remiss, <laughs> is 
th there's a math equation here. What are we aiming at? What's getting in our way? And what are ideas that you have to get to that vision and mitigate some of the barriers? So obviously, we're not quick enough at synthesis in this short amount of time to give you a reflective vision of what you said. But you know what you said. You know the conversation you've had at your table tonight. So you have a vision for what you think kids should know and be able to do. You named things that you think are getting in the way. What is one idea, 10 ideas? So we would love kind of an idea to realize that vision and mitigate the barriers. Because that's the conversation we're in collectively as a community. What are we aiming at? What's in our way? And what are some ideas to realize that? They could be big and bold. They could be small and mighty. You know, we want aspirational but feasible. You are not awash in resources if you didn't know that. I think you know that. But you're awash in talent, and you're awash in passion and people who really care about this. So one idea for Sticky, to realize your vision, as many ideas as you got on these stickies, please. Take uh, three minutes. No small task. Let you out early. Uh, you are welcome to stay. We will stick around, but I want to appreciate everyone's time. Um, so I, I've got a couple of quick thoughts. But she might have something to share first. She? she does. She's got the floor. All right. So thought number one from mundane to more important, uh, but important mundane. Make sure you sign in. It's really important. This is a really important conversation to connect everyone to, so we want to keep in touch with folks and keep them abreast of what is happening. So if you have not signed in, that's really important. Uh, number two, what is this process? Um, so in an ideal situation, we have as many of these as possible. We need your help. So if this felt like an interesting conversation, if it felt like a good meal, if it felt like, I can't promise meals in the future, but if it felt like a good conversation, it felt like something your neighbors, your friends, your family, your colleagues should be a part of, we need to do more of these because having lots of voices, the only thing you can do is you can aggregate demand. And what I mean by that is you can come up with a vision that is not the vision of 80 people or 100 people, which is where we're at after tonight, but you can come up with the visions of hundreds, if not thousands, of folks who are not condemning the existing people, but they're questioning the existing system because this is your city. So that is the call to action. In terms of the process at a more meta level, um, we have done, um, Reaching Higher has done a phenomenal job, Reaching Higher New Hampshire, some of whom are in the back of the room, Evelyn and Liz, um, have done a really phenomenal job talking to, knocking on thousands of doors and talking to, uh, in total, probably multiple thousands of residents. <clears throat> they have done um, an analysis of those conversations, and that is an amazing resource for this conversation, for this ongoing conversation. Two Revolutions, in partnership with Reaching Higher and in partnership with Manchester Proud, has looked at five buckets. What are we looking in buckets for? One bucket is teaching and learning. One bucket is finance. One bucket is governance. One bucket is community partnerships. And one bucket is organizational effectiveness. We have looked at five different categories of quantitative and qualitative data to not sit in judgment, that's not our place at all, but to look at what is working in this district and where might there be some gaps. And using the really rich community conversations plus that qualitative and quantitative analysis, we are working with a community planning group I think there were over 100 people who threw their hats in, and a couple of them are in the room tonight, 
and the community planning group is going to be making meaning of that data. And the objective is to use that process around a shared vision to decide on some big ideas, some smaller ideas in each of those categories, some structural suggestions for change, some cultural suggestions for change, and some practice suggestions for change. Um, so just by way of where you are in this conversation, I would argue that you know among the most important conversations is where are we going? And that's what this conversation is. I also think we need an evidence base for this conversation that's objective and third party and non-biased. So that's what the research, quantitative and qualitative, is trying to provide. Um, so I think if you are interested and you think friends, colleagues, family, others would be interested in another set of these conversations, let us know afterwards. And that demand will, will post to other sessions. Um, are there any questions or thoughts before we close? Usually we close with a group song, so that's okay. I've been practicing. <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> any questions or final comments? I have one. Please. Okay, so this is my son's school. This is where my son goes to school. And honestly, I wish that more of the parents from this school actually showed up. Because I think there's maybe like four of them. Okay. You know Excellent. what I mean? Because we're like one of the community schools, so we're the schools that kind of with certain things need to help more than some other schools. I just wish more parents would actually came to do this. And their opinions on what we can do to help our school. So maybe yeah. we can wish together and make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> All right, excellent, thank you. Anything else, comments, questions, ideas? Any idea that you wrote down burning a hole and you want to share it? Any idea, please? It's so tied in to the political face of Manchester, the foundation of Manchester. Um, this is the education system is, is not um, a world unto itself, and it's, it's complex, and the, the politics are, they're fraught. Um, you know, locally they have been for years and years. This is not a new situation, but I wish we understood that, and I wish that who we allowed to lead us politically on the school board and other ways um, were as educated as we're asking our students to be. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Um, i got to be careful how I say this, but... Remember our norms, please. Okay. Uh, I, I grew up in Manchester, born and raised. I still live here. Uh, my parents did not send me to public school because of way back in the 50s, 60s, lack of funding lack of resources. I didn't send my kids there also because of lack of funding. I chose not to teach here after I left to find <coughs> chemicals because being a science teacher, the most important thing is equipment and that's very expensive. Uh, our, where I taught in middle school, when I when I got elected for state rep, I took a tour of Central, and because it's in my community, and our labs in the middle school were better equipped than Central High School. Yeah. Yeah. The kids were actively engaged in their learning. You're not going to get anywhere if that's not there. Lecturing to them, showing videos, yeah. coloring paint. They need to get actively engaged, and that's a cost to yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Please. I just wish, to, I, I'm just going to do the flip commentary. I've been working in the district for 38 years. I wouldn't be anywhere else. Um, these kids need us. And, you know, the, 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 the mantra in Manchester for years, though we as educators hate this mantra, we do more with less. We do more with less because we love our kids. That's the strength of the school district. We love our kids. I wouldn't be anywhere else. All right. Final few. I want to respect your time, and if you need to go, because you planned on 7.30. Uh, 
So to address the revenue issue, because it seems like we're strapped for resources, and when the real estate market crashed, tax revenues went down, and we still haven't really recovered. Um, I've been doing a lot of research from the Solar Schools Initiative as a way to offset costs in some of the places, depending on how much they do actually create a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. um, so there's over 55, their 2017 report, there's over 5,500 schools that have solar on the roofs. All the roofs are flat, all the trees are already cut back, so you have direct sight. Um, and it's interesting from different places. Both my brothers are teachers in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and it started there about eight years ago, and it happened at my brother's district, and then every other district around them did it, because they were seeing, in, per school, a two to $7,000 difference in their electric bill. Mm -hmm. So I, I have an idea that I'm trying to propose to say, like, Every city building should have solar on it, and all the savings that we generate goes back into our schools. Because our my wife's a physician at the local hospital, and she's on the team that meets new doctors. And the real estate agents don't show houses in Manchester because of what the perception of the schools are. Yeah. And it, it, you know, like so many things, it just comes down to cash. Yeah. So if, you know, it's great that we can do more with less. But imagine if you had more. Mm. You know, like that's what yeah. we need. Like that would yeah. be even cooler, wouldn't it? <laughs> It'd be better. Yeah. And I think that's an example of, you know, a, a feasible, an aspirational but feasible idea that needs to be in this process. Whether it's right, wrong doesn't matter, or whether it's right for Manchester or not now. But we need the creativity and the energy of passionate people who vote to say, I've got some ideas, and this is a venue for that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to address what you Joan. Joan. See me after class. <laughs> My husband's here, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that makes so many different places, Joan. I just had an extra assignment for you, Joan. Presumptuous of Joan. So. Joan touched on an important issue, and you guys upheld the norms beautifully, um, and I appreciate that. There is a spoken in moments and unspoken part of this conversation, and I don't think it's as structural as it is cultural, uh, and the cultural piece of that is there is a really deep-seated culture of distrust. There's a lot of reasons we're actually putting together a little root cause analysis because it's, you're not unique, Manchester. <laughs> Systems everywhere struggle with this, but I think it's uniquely pervasive here, and I think it's acute, and lower resources correlates with, you know, it, it's aggravated more frequently here. And I think there will be lots of good ideas, I hope, that come through this process, but I think at its or addressing this kind of some of the cultural issues of distrust are central to kind of addressing some root causes that can really create shift. So I appreciate everyone's perspective. I do want to honor your time. Um, if you have other things to share. Please leave your um, yellow stickies on the tables because we're going to take them all and share them back with you, the ideas that came out. But just make, don't take them with you because I want them. And give yourselves a big hand. Thank you very much. Yeah, and if you, you want to stay in chat, we'll be here.